check and make sure that we're live. Okay. So, welcome to the Fall Book Club. My name is Maverick Evans, and I am here joined by Brooke and Riley, uh, the beautifuls. And uh, Ren is sick, so nice. he's not sick. He's just gone. <laughs> he's got other stuff to attend to. And so uh, he will not be with us today, unfortunately. Um, we will be covering and talking about Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, chapters 16 to 23. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to reiterate... Uh, these chapter numbers that we're using are representative of the number of like breaks in the text and the different like uh, what would probably be chapters. Um, so they don't actually have chapter headings or numbers, but we've assigned them numbers so that we can traverse through them a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And you can do the same at home if you're watching um, this on YouTube or something like that. Yes. Um, you can follow us in the chapter numbers. We read all the way to part three in this section. So. And if you're watching on YouTube, we have marked the chapters. Yes. So we will have timestamps. Good job, time stamps. Riley. Yes. Timestamps yes. <laughs> and show beginning. notes um, in nice. the description below. <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, definitely a really useful thing to know um, if you are are watching on YouTube and we say that at the front we yeah. usually say it at the very end and like that's <laughs> not very useful it, yeah. for anybody um so okay let's get right into it with chapter 16 summary um while mcmurphy and the boys continue to enjoy their baseball game uh which is really just a blank tv they're pretending uh to watch uh, chief bromden remembers that he must clean the staff room he is troubled by the possibility that he has outed himself as hearing after deciding to raise his hand and sit down to watch the world series with the rest of the boys he is prodded by an orderly and arrives at the staff meeting where he continues to listen in on their meeting concerning mcmurphy's recent behavior the doctors attempt to anticipate the big nurse's desires to send mcmurphy to the disturbed ward but are rudely mistaken nurse ratchet uh, states that she doesn't believe he is a super psychopath and that he is a man like any other. She continues saying that sending him to the disturbed ward is what the other patients expect and would only turn him into a martyr for them. She is determined to break him over the course of several weeks. She will now play the long game. Uh, so this is the first chapter uh, that we'll discuss today. What do you guys think about these chapters, first of all? I... I feel like it was, like, a real, like, progress towards, like, the uphill battle. Like, it was a yeah. lot of character progression in here. And, like, Chief, like, he's really changing a little bit with the introduction of McMurphy. It's just showing, like, how yeah. McMurphy is changing everybody and upsetting things. So, I loved it how he was like, oh, my gosh, what if they don't think I'm deaf? But if I don't go and clean the staff room, they're going to know for yeah, sure. Yeah, he's having, like, I, an intense so, internal struggle about whether or not to go in, whether it's more suspicious mm -hmm. and there was a to point stay where, out or go in. Yeah, it was freaky. And there was a point where he said he was, like, cleaning the wall, and she said something. It was the first time that she spoke, and everybody's head snapped towards her, and he said, including mine, and he was like, I had to just pretend there was a speck on the wall. <laughs> because um, it was just like her power and stuff and this was a huge power play on her so she's like men asking all the doctors at the staff room she's like boys what do you think and she's letting them talk and she's very quiet like very mm -hmm. stony and then you see her take a sip of her coffee and chief is like he was like it, that lipstick isn't coming off on our coffee that's just how hot she is right now <laughs> that it's leaving this molten ring on our coffee cup and she basically was like, I don't think McMurphy is that bad. And, like, someone was like, well, I don't think McMurphy's a coward. And he was like, no, he's not a coward, but he can be broken. And that's what she's, like, saying, like, I'm about to break him down. Like, mm -hmm. no problem. So. Yeah, they were all attempting. The doctors were attempting to anticipate whatever she wanted because she's in charge yeah, and so decides who gets fired and who stays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they were trying to address all of these really – um, these really flowery or superfluous like diagnoses and so they were like no he's he's a, a latent Oedipal or whatever mm -hmm. and so uh, you know all these different diagnoses that they were just giving to him despite not actually conducting any proper analysis of him like the, none of them had no. actually 
analyzed him uh -huh. properly. They had just kind of observed him operate in the ward throughout the past couple weeks. And so, yeah. like, really, it was just, um, I don't know what, what it would be. They're just kind of like... <laughs> it was like she was <laughs> I don't she know was how to making say, but it seem like they had power. <laughs> I get what you, you mean. know it was like she was making it seem like they were in charge that they actually yeah. had a job there when she's the one who's actually gonna be mm. calling all the shots so she was like yeah get your philosophy out and she was like actually here's what we're gonna do we're not gonna move him that was the big thing is that they're scared they're gonna move him to what's it called Dis the disturbed ward the disturbed, disturbed ward so that they were gonna move him and that would have been bad anyway to be moved there it's well, like higher security. I don't know if it would have been worse because it seems like this particular ward is like an anomaly that not everybody has a nurse ratchet reigning over them. And mm -hmm. so like that for me, I felt like that was part of her decision to keep him from going to disturbed so that mm -hmm. she, he could still well, be under her thumb. Well, she wants to be the one right. that breaks him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's like a personal tyrannical character. Yeah. So uh yeah, I don't I don't know. It's it's like really creepy because she was so adamant about sending him to disturbed until she was personally slighted by him so many times and now you can tell immediately that she has like this, this vendetta was, yeah and she's out for blood yeah she hates him and i i like it like i mean i like that there's this like huge conflict between them but also it's terrifying because it's like mcmurphy's out of his depth like with some of the stuff he's doing it's weird because like one of the first things that they bring um into conversation with this staff meeting that they have among the doctors and the head nurse is the fact the first thing that he says which is this truth and it's so terrible the way that these doctors just stifle the truth they don't even care about it all they care about is what the big nurse thinks yeah and so the first guy despite you know uh him thinking better of it i guess in the situation decides to actually say what he thinks which is that and it's actually the case mm -hmm. that um rp murphy mcmurphy decided to dupe everybody at the work camp so that he can come to his cushy life here at the institution and yeah. that he's a con man yeah. and so whenever and he said that, and yeah. they said they're, like, they're not going to admit to that but I think yeah, the reason yeah, that right. they um, condemned him for that idea is because they're just doing whatever they think will make the big nurse agree with him. And so they all look at her and she's not, you know, batting an eye or making any sort of expression that this is the answer she's looking for. So they're all immediately mm -hmm. like, oh, you're wrong. That's definitely not it. He's definitely mentally ill. He's not a con man. Yeah. And I like this description. And they're just throwing him under the bus. They have a description of how they pick apart the patients there. So they're discussing the patients. And Chief said, you know, they're talking about a patient so long that the, the patient materialized in the flesh, nude on the coffee table in front of them, vulnerable to any fiend fiendish notion they took. So mm -hmm. instead of working with the patient they're taking what they think they know and just like stripping that person apart and so i really like that juxtaposition because yeah. chief is so used to it he hears it happen all the time mm -hmm. where they just make these people inhuman they have no human attachment to any people on the ward yeah there's really no concern mm -hmm. for them um and, and i think chief bromden even mentions that at some point in his narration which is that you know, it doesn't, or may, maybe it was um, Harding, I don't know, but it's mentioned at some point in the book that it really doesn't matter whether or not the patients were there. It's the system that they've built. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's almost goes against their intention from the staff um, to even have the patients there. I mean, they're really just in the way mm -hmm. and the system needs to just operate mm -hmm. and that's it. So oh, they were saying that maybe he's a latent homosexual. So I was yeah, like, latent he's homosexual not or... Or uh, negative Oedipal, mm -hmm. suffering from negative Oedipal syndrome, no. uh, which I'm actually not even aware. I'm, I'm sure that that's a Freudian term, but I don't know what a negative Oedipal is. Um, uh, you think so that's like you hate like your the father? Like well, the Oedipal you, complex. You, negative Oedip Oedipal would maybe be like you have a thing for your dad? Maybe. Because the Oedipus complex is... is your the eatable com the eatable complex is um, the overly close relationship that you've developed with your mother 
So and maybe yeah. negative. It refers um, to Oedipus. Uh, Oedipal. Oedipus Rex. Wouldn't it be Greek, Oedipal? In the Greek yeah. tragedy. Yeah. Um, he becomes uh, blinded, like to the fact that he's too close with his mother, has intercourse with her, and that as a result blinds himself and then goes into exile. So that's where the Freudian term comes from. Wouldn't but, it be Oedipal then? Because the Oedipus complex is spelled that way. And you can say Oedipal. 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 Oh, okay. So would negative. Oedipal be like you're not attracted to your mom and you're attracted to your dad. I'm, you I, hate your mother. I have no idea. Oh know. man, that already came out. Um, it says in the context of psychoanalytic theory, the negative Oedipus complex is the inverse of the Oedipus complex, in which young boys will desire their mothers and assume their fathers. Um, but this is a di- this one. This is the flip of it. They will see their mothers as rivals and their fathers as oh, okay. It's it's just a flip of it. Mm. So he was too close rivals. to so his, he, his father. Okay, so he has problems with women, and but they're he no, they're is just, attracted to men. This is them just shooting crap. They're well, they're not doing anything. Yeah, no, but this just, guy says that, and everyone's like, "Yes, exactly. That is the answer." No, they're just saying like whatever. Like, yeah, they but don't like, really know what they're. They're talking all congratulating about. that guy because he sounds the most intellectual. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think this chapter was just very her flicking the domino. Like you know what? Like let me move my chess piece because like he's already done this, but mm-hmm. she's making big moves. She's like, you know what? I'm gonna toy with him for a little while longer. He's not gonna move boards. Yeah. Well, she regains her constitution. She realizes that you know. Um, the ball is in her court and she can play the game how she likes and the system that she's built up up to this point over several decades long time is in her favor Mm -hmm. and she doesn't have to do anything that she doesn't want to and that she has all the time in the world to put some pressure on him and eventually break him so yeah scary she scares Um, me going into chapter 17 the summary for chapter 17 um Chief is slightly worried about the big nurse's confidence leaving the staff meeting, but then reflects on McMurphy's resilience in the coming weeks. McMurphy continues to act just as he always had by playing pranks and teasing the staff until their faces and necks glow red. Chief says that he uh, can be so strong because he isn't anyone but himself, and then thinks on how he, Chief, can never seem to be himself. It seems the fog is cleared for Chief, so that late at night he opens his eyes in bed and begins to experience the the world fully in all its detail. Chief leaves uh, leaves his bed and walks to a window, looking out and Mm -hmm. taking in every part of the moonlit countryside. He is then noticed by the nurses and orderlies, taken back to bed, tied up, and drugged once again. So, And there's a lot of details in between all of that. That was really good. Uh, My favorite thing about this chapter is McMurphy like purposely doesn't want to clean the toilets. He gets assigned toilet duty. I don't think he does this in this in this chapter. No, it, it yeah, is this does. one. In chapter 17. He says yeah. he'd uh personally thank her for the honor and think of her every time he swabs a urinal. Okay. So, he has he gets assigned urinal yes, duty yes, because yes. she was like, "You know what? I'm going to give you the nastiest job here." And so he just splashes a little bleach on it, and he's like, that's good. And he tells the orderly, he's like, I'm just going to pee in here anyway. I'm not going to eat lunch out of it. And so Nurse Ratchet is taking a compact mirror, and she's looking underneath every toilet, and she's saying, this is an outrage. This is an outrage. And he's like, keeps walking next to her, and he goes, no, ma'am, that's a toilet. That's a toilet. (laughs) Like, every time that she's like, this is an outrage. (laughs) Is messing with her, and that was like. But the she's like part. really keeping her cool now, cause she's in it for the long haul of just being calm, not reacting or anything. He gets her mm-hmm. one time though, cause she's going around with that little mirror, looking up on the insides of all the toilet bowls, and he had, uh, Chief said, marked on a piece of paper some kind of foreign language, right? Foreign characters, and he doesn't know what they were, and he takes this uh, bit of wet gum and pokes it right up onto the inside of the toilet bowl and he had just wrote a, a perverse word uh, yeah, backwards yeah. so that she could read it in the mirror yeah and, and she it drops her, her she mirror. drops it into the, the toilet. toilet yeah it's so funny like he's just really messing with her and this is like the point like where he's he's just kind of unaware of like the situation of like what she's already decided 
she's gonna do with him i'm terrified what's gonna happen to him oh my god I like know. he keeps pushing her like i'm like oh no like what's gonna happen to him? i've seen clips from the movie so i think i know i don't know well no spoilers no spoilers right? <laughs> well i haven't even seen the movie and i don't even know I who the characters no are <laughs> i don't know who's yeah. playing who in the movie so 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 in no this idea. chapter it's really cool because he does huh? all of this like prank stuff and for the most part it doesn't really develop anything it just kind of it's just solidifying more action and chief changing Chief changes a ton. Chief changes yeah. a ton. So he's getting clarity and not just this sleepy man. And he's looking at himself in the mirror and he's seeing himself and being able to go outside and smelling things. And he's like, it's fall. And he was like, it's already fall here. Like, and he's realizing that time is passing him by while he's in here and that he hasn't even bothered to look outside yeah. the entire time that he's here. And he hasn't really even been able to. And so I think that's kind of why this whole action with McMurphy is in there with all of his pranks and stuff is mm -hmm. because he those actions and those pranks and teasings and like laughing at all the orderlies is what is making the fog disappear for mm -hmm. uh chief so I, it's and the, again the fog is kind of weird because there's like we know most likely that it's the drugs that he's taking and, it and could the be also the electroshock yeah therapy. the, elect the yeah, est the, therapy but the uh, residual from it but yeah. i do think it's part of me he is a little mentally ill and he was he was referencing his dad saying like before papa got like went off this so he's talking about his dad kind of going off the deep end too mm -hmm. so like there's a reason why chief is in the insane asylum right now and i don't know why but like there's a i mean that he's in there for a reason mm -hmm. i think that he probably i really think that maybe mental illness like the juxtaposition between him being depressed and having this like not being able to think clearly and being on all these drugs is just a thing for it's a good juxtaposition for like depression and just having all this these like heavy feelings and not being able to move yeah yeah i mean I would it's, say it seems like, like it's like neurological in combination with psychological mm -hmm. so yeah. it's like hard to tell what's hard what's wrong with chief because he was shocked so many times and he is under drugs all the time but then he's experiencing this this like psychological stimulant which is like mcmurphy mm -hmm. making life better for everybody mm -hmm. yeah right? giving them something he to definitely like seems more like in acute in his brain like his actual functioning and everything he is not like most of the chronics because yeah. even they didn't join in with the voting and stuff right well, and this is what the book does a really good job of um conveying is that um chief is crazy like, I mm -hmm. really do think that he's, like, yeah, not he's well. Yeah, he's got something wrong with him. Yeah. yeah. So, um... But, so, I like, mean, I they all do. just don't know why he has something wrong with him. Like, I don't know, I like, he, how he ended up in... If he ended up in the institution and they trauma? made him worse. Or, like, I'm sure that they perpetuated I his issues. I don't know, and I'm trying to figure that out, too, because, apparent, you know, he was referring to him playing football in high school. And, and in he, college, he was he studying. He had a normal, like... Yeah, he had, like, a normal life, and he mm -hmm. went to college. So there is a time where Chief has just kind of fallen apart. And he kind of, and there's some part in the book where he references his dad. He was, like, before Papa started getting mad or before Papa started getting angry. So I think that he, his, him and his dad might have something similar. I don't know. And he always refers to the machine of the hospital, and he's like, the gears grinding to a halt. Like he but can, I think that's... He can feel that. And I know that that's, that's also a metaphor, but I think Chief, like, really does see this place as, like... Um, uh, so that's another thing. I think that maybe it was in the previous chapter or even... Because of maybe his this nightmare. One. That's why I think it's a real delusion for him. He talks about how this... And tell me if this is in, a, like, a future chapter. Um, he talks about the fog machines in relation to his time in the military and how when he was in the military this he would go into chapter, I is it in a future chapter i don't remember this mm, when he no, was in the, the military machine, like coming through the vent like the airfields would be filled with fog and it was because the military would start the fog machines up and he says that this is the same fog machine that they use in the hospital that they had bought it from an army surplus and that I, they yeah, put it in the vents. Yeah, he probably might have PTSD then, too. Yeah. So, Good. but for me, and I didn't even look this up, I'm pretty positive there's no such thing as a massive fog machine that the military uses. No. So, I mean, if he, um, went to he went to college, he was in high school, like, I mean, when did he have time to be in the military? 
And if he was in the military, well, he might have been in the draft because if we're looking at like time period, it was the 60s. Vietnam. Vietnam? No, not Vietnam. He would have been World War Two. Because mm. Chief's kind of old now. Yeah. Yeah. In the 60s? Yeah, he was old because Chief or was like pretty the old. 60s now. Oh, okay. So he would have been in, for- in the 40s. Then yeah. I don't know. Oh well, yeah, around that time period, like all the veterans were like World War Two veterans, and they're at least in their fifties and forties. Yeah, so I don't know what how old all is that he is now? About. Huh? How they old al- is he? They now? always refer to him as a big old Indian. Big old Indian, yeah. Big old Indian. Okay. They call him old man. He has, I think, he has gray hair. And if the movie is any constellation, he's at life. least forty-five. Yeah, at least. Oh, okay. He's at least like older. So, so I don't know about all that, but that's part of like his delusion as well, mm-hmm. is that his delusion even infects a lot of his memories, I feel like. So for me, I'm not sure if Chief was experiencing hallucinations or other kinds of paranoia even when he was in the free world, and eventually he just got picked up for it and put into the institution. And I don't know. I have no idea. Or if his memories him. have been malformed now and affected by his brain being um, Maybe shocked. he just had, like, one breakdown, and now he's just been so abused in the facility that he's just degraded so yeah. much. I have no clue. Hopefully we find out in, yeah. in the book at some point. Um, but, yeah, so uh, I don't think that there's another part of this. We, we can see here again with Chief um, in Chapter 17 that he's just continuing to see the world for what it means rather than what it is Mm -hmm. right so this is why chief is so important because he uh, he is able to explore the fact that there is more than one way to look at reality Mm -hmm. and the way that the world um, is constructed which is you can either look at things from a materialistic perspective which is what is or you can look at the world from a more meta perspective, which is what those things mean. Mm-hmm. And so continually, Chief is interpreting the meaning of everything that is happening in the world. If he's listening and eavesdropping, um, even when he cleans the staff room, it's covered in slime. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it, right? that's not real. Yeah, like, there's, not yeah, really there's no slime. slime on the walls. He's saying that there's slime yeah. from like all the yeah. evil things that they're doing. And when saying, they gossip and conspire against the patients, they materialize on on the table, and then they're cut to pieces and stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he he sees things that very symbolic. Right. Yeah. Everything is what it means rather than what it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's a really cool way to look at like his illness is like exploring a legitimate portion of the world that we see in literature and all kinds of other stuff but chief experiences it visually yeah everywhere he goes so that's an important and, detail yeah and we talked about this last week about maybe or last time that maybe he thinks in pictures um mm-hmm. and looking and stuff like that because he's just so he thinks in memories mm-hmm. yeah like because he he's always going back to like referring things back to when he was a kid and like when things happen like when he smells the air and he's like i think about like when i was with my family and like sleeping in grandma's woven blankets and like Mm -hmm. just all this different things so he ties everything back constantly but i loved this chapter when he could just look out at the moon and he saw the dog and just like thinking about that there was something there's life life is still continuing outside of where he is yeah that's and i think i big character development here Mm -hmm. Uh, I wrote a little bit about this. Um, There's a small dialogue that I wrote here about just one of the big themes or messages that I see in this story as we go into the next chapter. Um, And I said, as far as I can see it, Mr. Chief Bromden has explored the idea that the world can be understood in more ways than its material fact or status of reality, but instead the meta meaning. Chief sees things uh, for what they are expressed as, Uh, his own unconscious visions and hallucinations. He sees them for their meaning rather than their fact of matter. He describes the fog as something imposed by the powers that be and how this fog allows him to sink away into nothing where time passes in a second and stops all at the same time. This fog is comfortable and welcoming despite the feeling in the back of his mind saying no or don't succumb to this fate. While in the fog, uh, Chief is unable to see much but what he can see is in greater detail than it would have been outside of the fog. He sees the face of one of his commanding officers and describes it in great detail. He describes the experience of looking in his CO's face as being difficult and painful. 
um, but that you had two choices. You either look on these painful details and find your way or look away and be lost forever. Uh, this, I believe, is the guiding message of the book, is that you should not hide from the world, but rather confront it head on, looking the pain in the face, um, taking in every ugly detail, refusing to lose your way, and refusing to cast yourself into the fog. You must mm -hmm. always confront the ugly reality, the ugly world, rather than retreating and refusing to contact the world. This, in my belief, is the call of the hero. Um, Chief throughout the book explores ex extemporaneously and without verbal understanding the call of the hero by witnessing McMurphy answer that call every day. Despite the orderlies and the big nurses attempting to put their boot on his head, Chief also attempts to find what allows a man to answer the call of the hero and withstand the combine or the crushing strength of the powers that be. And he suggests that McMurphy being himself is what gives him such power to hold out and withstand such a crushing force. Mm -hmm. but can't figure out how how um, he might go about doing his own true self. So that's like one of the the big things that I feel like is just with throughout the entire book. Like everything is just Chief attempting to figure out what gives McMurphy the power to do what he's doing. Yeah, definitely. And this was a part, a part of the book that allowed Chief to realize who he is, that he had walked through the on those tiles – and the lino linoleum for many years, but had never actually felt it. Yeah. And so all of the things that he saw out in the countryside were things that immediately brought back memories of his past experiences that are part of what make him who he is. And mm -hmm. so it's a shame that at the end of the chapter, he ends up just getting tied up and drugged again. I, yeah, it's so sad. So mm -hmm. it's like a really downtrodden um, and, and you know they don't they don't go outside they don't they don't get any like human stuff that they really need they need to go out and like breathe in fresh air and like sit and they don't have any human like s like real substance that they actually i would cry if i couldn't go outside on a nice day oh yeah so well they've uh, just multiplied i mean the nurse ratchet has multiplied the rules and regulations beyond necessity yeah. and that yes. is deliberately done in an effort to break them so also yeah. she wants complete control over everything total control. if she feels like she doesn't have control over something then she has to make new rules where she can mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's even seen in the next chapter yeah mm -hmm. so going into chapter 18 uh, McMurphy continues to encourage the putting forth of petty grievances among the patients during the group therapy sessions. The patients seem to be dropped, propped up by McMurphy and his ability to buck the system so that they too can buck so long as he lends a hand in doing so. The ward is brought to the swimming pool and McMurphy has a short conversation with one of the patient lifeguards and finds out that being committed is much different than being convicted and imprisoned. McMurphy realizes that until he begins to toe the line, the big nurse may never clear him to be released. This rude awakening makes McMurphy begin to behave and complete mm -hmm. his daily tasks with diligence and skill. The support uh, the other patients were receiving from him is now lost. Morale drains from every man in the ward, but they understand his decisions to be cagey like the rest of them and don't blame him for refusing mm -hmm. to come to their aid in complaint and hell raising. The end of this chapter is punctuated when Cheswick um, one of the more verbal patients dives into the pool on another pool day, gets his fingers stuck in the bottom grate of the pool, and by the time the orderlies can use a screwdriver to remove him, he is drowned. Yeah. Um, was, that was bad. Yeah. So um, that was a really abrupt and shocking end to that yeah. little portion. I mean, I was not expecting that. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't put a bunch of people with mental illness be like, yeah, get some water altogether. Yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah, it's like no, it's too easy. And oh, and they hit them with sticks if they try to hold on to the sides. They like push them and stuff. Yeah, to get them off the sides. I'm like, why? And um, Chief was like, I just stayed next to him. He was like, usually I feel like I'm gonna drown, but I. He was like, I never do. I'm like too tall in the water. But he's like, I'm kind of scared of. The water. Yeah, he's, he was, like, Chief was scared of getting sucked so he, down the drain and sent out to sea. Uh huh. So yeah. he's just sitting there hanging out with mcmurphy and this is when mcmurphy's just like oh my god i could be stuck here forever because mm -hmm. like it's indefinite like he doesn't know when he's gonna get out and the guy was like hey um 
I've been, I came here um, for Drunk and Disorderly, and I've been here for eight years. And yeah. he was like, uh, what? Like, <laughs> he was like, you're kidding me, right? And then Mick Murphy realizes, like, okay, I had four, uh, two months out of a six-month sentence, like, already done at the work farm. And he could have been out of here. Oh, and that's one of the more gutting pieces of information that you get because you just hear like how short a stint he was gonna do, which was six months, mm-hmm. I think. And, and he could have gotten. That's out. what he was thinking about. He could have just did. did the six months at the at the work camp and then been done with it. But yeah. instead, he's yeah. stuck here now, and so that's like gut wrenching because you know, as a reader, that like that he's got himself into something far worse than well, he ever Well, because he did he did two months already at the work camp, and he had four months left. And he was just thinking that maybe coming here, he could serve those four months a little bit more in leisure. And he's finding out now that he like, could be here he could, forever. Yeah. He could be in here, in there forever. And this is like huge. And he's like, oh my God, I need to get out of here. He could be stuck here forever. And that's so scary to me. So scary. Oh yeah. And then they had the guy with hydrocephaly in the, what's a foot bath? Um, a foot bath is just a, a small uh, recessed pool that you can sit on the edge. So like just like you would like sit on the edge of a pool and oh, just like put a, your feet yeah, in. Like a baby. Pool. It's like a very small hot tub. Okay. It's so like a really shallow hot tub. That was yeah. disturbing. Everybody's like, help him up. Like we're trying to help up this guy with hydrocephaly, but he kept like wanting to go back in there. And I just imagine him just like rolling around, like Man, spinning. Poor guy. And like really like so like hydrocephalus or whatever he had. I don't know what it was called. Just imagine him with a big old head. Yeah, he had a really swollen head that gained a lot of water and like swollen parts of his body and stuff because they just swell with water. I'm like, oh man, that must look like a creature, like not I, a human. Yeah, even. him just rolling around in the foot bath. No, and everybody's like, let's help him up. Let's help him up. And it like does nothing. He just wanted to go back into the foot bath and just roll yeah. around. Yeah, oh my that was gosh. disturbing. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a ton of well, I mean, and there's chronics that are just that same disturbing in their ward too, like nailed to the wall, like t- tied to the wall, mm-hmm. you know, and a bunch of other chronics that are just like you know in terrible condition and like if you look at them for too yeah. long you'll be disturbed because yeah. they're creatures yeah they're not even humans anymore yeah you know he's turned into smeagol i just kind of imagine smeagol uh. like floating around in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> gosh <laughs> nice. golem yeah so, that was really sad and then cheswick man i was not expecting because i'm sure they were like and they were like his fat fingers got stuck in the grate mm-hmm. and so instead of the orderlies being like, yeah, let's jump in there. They just... Honestly, if someone gets their fingers stuck in a grate at the bottom, like, first of all, I think it's going to take a people a while to figure out that you're even down there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, this is not going to go well. Like, you're probably going to drown anyways, let alone, like, being stuck down there. Yeah, like, they, it sounded people... like they couldn't get him unstuck because yeah. they had to take the grate. First of all, if someone is drowning and their fingers are stuck in a grate... You get your ass down there, and you put both your feet on the bottom of the pool, and, and you, you rip pull their and hand you rip off. his fingers off. Yeah. You do not wait to unscrew it. Yeah. He can live without a couple fingers, but he will just be dead with them. They don't care if he lives or dies. So, yeah, exactly. They were, like, they were probably just like watching him for Any- a second, and then we're like... I guess we need to get him out. Yeah, like any sane lifeguard would just rip his fingers off. Like, that's yeah. the obvious thing to do to save his life. But, no. And then they have a lifeguard, which is just another patient. That's not a lifeguard. And that's another the lifeguard patient. was he, a guy from the disturbed unit. Ward. Yeah. And he, yeah. W- he was like, you see this cast on my arm? And McMurphy's like, there's no cast on your arm, bud. And he keeps <laughs> yeah. talking yeah. about it like there is one. And he's talking about, he was oh, like, the nurses are telling me it's going to be better. Well, you know what's funny about that, too, is that I'm sure a lot of these characters are, like, inspired by, like, true patients and stuff. People that he knows. And I don't doubt it that that guy was a really good football player and suffered so many concussions that he ended up in. Gronkowski. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I mean, that was a good movie by... Uh, uh, that Will Smith was in, and concussion? I forget. Yeah, concussion. Oh, yeah. What's it called? It's it's called concussion. You're right. No, yeah, the that's a movie. disease, a the brain disease that football players get. Uh, I forget, but it's, it's like about just e- repeated contusions. Yeah. Man, I can't I know what you're talking what about called. though. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that's like a really good movie talking about um, 
the concussions and the neurological damages that football players suffer, especially in the 70s to where, like, you know, a lot of times football players will experience the concussion issues and then they'll kill themselves. Um, but today, now when we get, like, NFL player suicides, they'll shoot themselves in the heart because they know that they can contribute their brain to uh, science? science and studies. Oh, nice. Um, because well because Gee, they know thank you for killing yourself well, so they, they that we know can study that your brain there's something wrong with them in their head and so that's why they always shoot themselves um, in the heart who was it Ma um robin williams like when they dissected his brain he actually had something like they could see uh this disease like affecting his brain my and, mom thought he was, he was probably in, bipolar that's what well. they thought but he actually got diagnosed and you can only diagnose it posthumously because you can't tell until you actually open up their brain. And yeah. Their brain is just so inflamed and messed up. And so he was in an extreme amount of pain and could not verbally express it. He could not tell people what was going on inside of his brain. And um, so eventually he... Uh, because, yeah, he was actually diagnosed bipolar. People talked about that. How he actually did have a bunch of problems. But he said that he would just get so, like, painfully sad, and he just didn't know why. Astro says that the disease is called infilitis. Infilitis? There's, a, there's an it's acronym terminal. for it. Yeah, oh, something like that. I don't remember what the acronym is. Uh, yeah, it says, uh, the, while conducting an autopsy on, on former NFL player Mike Webster, forensic pathologist Dr. Bennett Omalu discovers neurological deterioration that is similar to Alzheimer's disease. Um, Omalu names the disorder chronic traumatic uh, in encephalo encephalopathy CTE. yeah cte, CTE. syndrome so okay. um Not yeah that one nfl player he like shot his girlfriend and then killed himself mm -hmm. and he had the worst case of cte that they had like ever seen yeah and i think um the same with probably antonio brown and uh mm -hmm. gronkowski yeah whenever they die their brain is probably going to be so inflamed i don't doubt that every single nfl suicide that occurs is is a result of cte i'm oh, sure definitely of it. yeah so except for you aaron hernandez <laughs> <laughs> burn burn so so we see this in the patient that is serving as a lifeguard for the pool he's a former Pretty football crazy. player and i think he was a college football player wasn't he mm -hmm. he wasn't pro I thought he was. Um, was okay. he pro? He was a pro footballer. Okay, no, he's, yeah. he's, for talking the Browns. About, he's talking about playing okay, yeah. the Browns. So, yeah. so he was in a Back former... Back when the Browns so what, were good. <laughs> whatever team he played for, I don't know. It was a long time ago. Um, yeah. But he's a pro football player, and he still thinks that he is going to continue playing football. Yeah, but I'm he guessing like, he's past middle age by now. He's talking about like whenever his arm heals and he can go and play the Browns again. And McMurphy's just like, oh, I need to get out of here. Mm -hmm. Because this guy is telling him that he came in completely normal and just for drunk and disorderly, which is something that McMurphy has done. And he's been here eight years and he is crazy. This is a big, like, oh crap moment for McMurphy. And he's yeah. like, I've been playing games with this lady who has my fate in her hands. Yeah, he gets really upset he, by well, it. Well, he thinks it's not even worth it anymore. So that brings us to the next two chapters, um, which are very short. So mm -hmm. uh, chapter 19, uh, a patient named Seffelt. Uh, is it Seffelt? Seffelt. 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 Um, suffers. Seffelt suffers a seizure as a result of his not taking his medication. Mm -hmm. McMurphy inquires about his condition and finds out that the medication prevents the seizures but rots your gums, which is why Mr. Seafelt refuses to take his meds and instead gives them to his bunkmate, Mr. Fredrickson, who takes double dosages. His teeth are, like, absolutely rotting out of yeah, his head. Yeah, he's saying it's yeah. making his gums soft. Yeah, his gums are soft and rotting away pretty much, um, and it's pretty disgusting. So, I mean, in this chapter, I didn't really even notice a ton of, like, I don't know. It was There's basically really McMurphy it. saying, like, okay, well, why didn't you take your medicine? And he's understanding, like, why people are bucking the system and why people won't buck the system. So it's and like how him, it's like, a damned if you do, people. damned if you don't situation. Yeah. Because whether you, whether you take the medication, 
then you're, if you take the medication, your gums will get soft and rot. If you don't take the medication, mm-hmm. you'll suffer seizures. And how some people And need if to be you in don't, there. they'll shock you and induce a seizure. Yeah. So I think we'll get into that in the, the next, next chapter. The next chapters, there's a really short chapter. Yeah, so chapter 20, I'm just going to read aloud as we get into that one. Yeah. Um, let me, f- oh shoot, I don't even know which one is chapter 20 now that I am looking at it. Which one is it like the small? It starts whatever. It there we go. Uh, whatever it was went haywire in the mechanism. They've just about got it fixed again. The clean, calculated arcade movement is coming back. 6.30 out of bed, 7 into the mess hall, 8 the puzzles come out for the chronics and the cards for the acutes. In the nurse's station, I can see the white hands of the big nurse float over the controls. So that is chapter 20. Um, it's really short. Um, and that's about it things are returning back to normal back to normal yeah yeah and yeah. the fog is coming back in and it's everything scary. um so and this is all as a result of mick murphy's um you know refusal now to continue with his antics and that he doesn't want to buck the system anymore because he is obviously a smart dude mm-hmm. you know and he can see that he could be kept here indefinitely and or end up in the shock shop and so we'll explore more of that in this chapter chapter 21 um mr this is an interesting chapter um mr harding's wife vera pays him a visit in the library she asks him during their conversation for a cigarette but he is halfway through smoking his last one and he refuses to give it to her so obviously this is like a stingy moment for him um vera vera remarks that he never has um has to give anything she asked for Uh, She then turns to McMurphy and asks for one of his smokes, to which he obliges. Uh, Harding and his wife bicker an argument, and she leaves, both of them upset. Harding then asks McMurphy what he thinks of her, and he responds by blowing up on him. Uh, McMurphy tells Harding that they are both to blame for their marital issues, um, but is too rough in his delivery, so he decides to apologize to him that evening. After his apology to Harding, McMurphy complains of bad dreams of faces, McMurphy is playing cards in the former hydrotherapy room and fumbles his cards while shuffling, indicating that McMurphy is losing his grip on things and becoming discouraged with his stay in the ward. So, McMurphy's losing his hold on stuff. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. And Um. he's, like, losing his shit on people, and, like, he can't even, like, cut cards anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's just getting mad and losing his... He's scared. He's losing his grip. Yeah, he's scared. And then we have... um, Harding, who Man, is Harding literally is in so there because rude. his wife is a hoe, and he was <laughs> like, he's like, I'm so scared my wife is gonna cheat on me. She's flirting with everybody. She's walking up in there, bad and bougie. Nails pretty sure done. she's gonna have sex with one of the orderlies. Snatched. Like I'm pretty sure that that Probably. was the whole thing. She, no, she but was he like, was don't scared. forget your promise. As he walks she away, she kissed him on the cheek. Yeah, in front of her husband because she likes to mess with him. And he was like, what do you think of her? And he was like, if you want me to call your wife a slut, like I'm not gonna do it. That's what you want for me. And he was like, I'm not, he was like, I'm just not going to buy into it anymore, guys. Mm-hmm. And he gets, like, outraged. He's also so rude to her Whenever about calling her stupid all the time. She, well, she Anytime she says he, anything, he's like, he corrects her grammar. He's and like, well, that's like, a double negative, dear. And he was like, that if you went to school, you constitutes a double negative, that. yeah. And he was, <laughs> he's using this really, like, uppity language. And she's obviously not as intellectual as he is. And I don't know why they're married. She just seems pretty, like, below average. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense yeah. why they're together. Why is but she I with think him? the reason that she flirts a lot more also is because at the beginning he said he thinks she's cheating on him because she's attractive and she has big boobs, so she must be cheating on him. I think she might be, though. <laughs> like, I think she, she could actually, be. I think might, she but is. <laughs> I think she also could be just playing it up because she knows that he's weird and jealous about her because she's hot. And so she's just being a bitch. Wow. Yeah, basically. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I don't know what started, which came first, the chicken or the egg on that one. But. Because it, well, it they both like, fuel each other. It's yeah. like, yeah, she, she loves it. That's why she's showing up there. Why is she still married to him when he's like, yeah, I'm gonna go commit myself. This shaky man who puts her down, leave. You're beautiful. You can find another husband. She's still with him. I don't think. I think just because she doesn't care. Yeah. I mean, I have. I think that he had a good amount of money because he was a doctor before he came in or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I wouldn't leave him. I'm sure she has a nice house at the home, and she still can just go do whatever she wants. So. I mean, yeah, That's he's true. committed. It's like she doesn't even have a husband. 
She just visits him sometimes. Yeah, and I doubt after her experience with Harding that she even wants to commit to somebody else. So, like, she just kind of has the best of both worlds at the moment. Crazy. (laughs) Oh, Um, man. In the piece of wood that he shoves in his mouth when he has a seizure, that the orderly, he just has a paint stick or, like, I just imagine, like, a paint stir stick. Yeah, Seffelt. When Seafelt has a... That's something we left out about the previous chapters. They just put a wooden stick, stick in that in dude's the, mouth. In that mouth. And yeah, he just and he crunches on it. broke it. He broke the stick. Immediately. And he lodged two of his teeth into the stick. Mm-hmm. And, and they broke off. And nasty. In the stick. Gross. So. He was. He first was, of all, who the hell uses a wooden stick for that? For a bite? For they, a so bite they thing. won't bite their tongue off? I know, but You're they could. They use a belt. Yeah, like a belt or, or something. Cloth. Leather or cloth it's or rubber. Literally something so you can't break yeah. and like get your teeth in. Yeah, teeth broken, yeah. Because oh, like what's the difference? I mean, wood is only mildly softer than a tooth. I mean, like it's still not as like it compacts pretty quick mm-hmm. to where if you bite on it, it's now pretty much Why just as hard as a tooth. So hard, yeah. Like wood Even is a not book the would answer. Be better than a wooden stick. I'm telling you, they don't. They literally don't know how to do anything in this at all. They have no. Terrible. I just don't think they, they care a whole lot to learn. And then whenever he came out of a seizure, that like the nurse, like you know, he's over here just like bleeding and feeling crummy and she's like you didn't take your medicine did you like she was like that's what you get for not taking your medicine i know that you've been hiding your medicine he, he's been getting it somewhere like and she just make she's making uh frederickson feel bad but oh my gosh she immediately she was like that's what you get like got it getting on to him yeah she's evil Mm -hmm. honestly it's terrible and that was a good point too when they like pointed out the hypocrisy of it they're like they give us medication to prevent us from having seizures but then they send other people that don't suffer from um from seizures they're not yeah to give them a seizure to what is the what's the the est well it's est yeah but it's not like uh, people who like suffer from like bright lights they're epilepsy yeah, yeah people who don't suffer epilepsy they send them to the shock shop for EST to trigger seizures. Yeah. So why do they give epileptic epileptic folk medicine to prevent seizures, but then other people they, they induce they them? They trigger the they seizures. trigger the mm-hmm. seizures. They have so, no method in their treatment. Terrible, absolutely wretched. Well, they're just doing whatever they want. And then we have Martini with the hydrotherapy stuff, and he's like messing with the the switch on it. Whoever yeah. Martini is, it's really Martini, funny. They just yeah. introduce random. He's characters. acting like he's well. Like Martini's been around, him, right? and he's like breaker, breaker, and he's like, yeah. Bing, like messing yeah. with the switch <laughs> on it, and he's just like, uh, he's sitting there like. <laughs> <laughs> so Marty was like, "Do you um, not not Marty, but Martini?" So he's like, "Do you see him? Do you see him, McMurphy?" And he's like, "No." I literally like he's getting upset and he's like no i don't see them i don't see the mark like i'm he doesn't sorry i want to play around he just doesn't want to play yeah. with the whole like feeding into their mental illness anymore and he's tired of it yeah because and like he has a pretty big um blow up about it in the next uh coming chapter i believe oh my god this yeah is this crazy. is the next chapter yeah. so um, so we'll go into chapter 22 now. Mm-hmm. Um, McMurphy has a conversation with Harding about the shock shop and EST, um, which is electroshock therapy, um, and how it is seldom used except by Nurse Ratchet, and that it's the, the procedure and treatment is really being phased out by now. I mean, not a lot of people, just like hydrotherapy was phased out fairly quickly, mm-hmm. um, so is EST. Uh, During their conversation among the other boys, McMurphy finds out that most of the patients in their ward are not, in fact, committed against their will, but instead have checked themselves in and choose to stay despite all their belly aching. McMurphy can't believe it and starts in on a tirade, asking why they don't go out and enjoy life when they have the opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. Billy Billy Bibbit responds uh, by crying and, and saying that they are too weak and that they are made fun of in the real world um, and that they just can't do it. No one says anything, and McMurphy is astonished and just can't seem to make sense of it all. This and shocked me. Like, I mean, why, like, why? I knew that they were all in there, but, like, it was kind of just, like, 
didn't shock me. I knew all the. Well, clearly it shocked you if that's what you're saying. Okay, here. This is what I'm saying. It was a surprise, right? It wasn't a surprise to me about that. It was a surprise to me that, like, he was. They were like, yeah, make change, McMurphy. And for what? Like, you're choosing to live there. Mm-hmm. You're like, you're choosing to be there. And he's he's thinking that he's a hero for these people who are, like, stuck in this prison, this jail. And he's like, while we're here, like, we might as well have a good time. But he was like, what have I been doing this for? And so I was like, that's true. Like, and they haven't made it known to them. And there's so many people that, like, you know, they're allowing themselves to be shocked and tortured and treated like crap. Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah, I'll sign up for it. I'll pay money to be here. Yeah. Yeah. McMurphy yeah. finds out that the patients there, most of the patients are not only prisoners, but their own guards as well. They hold the keys to their, their cells and they refuse to let themselves out. So. And then he gets made to feel bad because we have, I can't remember his name that has a stutter. Uh, Billy Bibbit. And he's really young. Billy he, Babbitt or Bibbit? Billy Bibbit. Right? Babbitt. Babbitt? Billy Babbitt. Hold on. I, don't I thought know. it was Babbitt. It's I don't remember. B I B B I T. Huh? Hold on. <laughs> Astra says free healthcare. Am I right? Shit orderlies. <laughs> <laughs> Billy B. Okay, so he was like, he was like, dude, you should be Billy out. B. <laughs> he he was like McMurphy's like, why are you in here? You should be out chasing tail, riding your Corvette, being young. Like, why are you in here? And he was like. He basically was like, yeah, I c- c- could do that. And he, he's having his stutter. And he was like, you don't know what it's like. He was like, I can't just walk out of here. And he was like, if I could, like, because of my mom or whatever else. He was like, I can't function in regular society. And he's realizing, like, oh, he okay. said he really wants to he be wants out to, in the real but world. He, but he, he he's not uh, big and tough like uh, McMurphy like, is. Yeah. And he people make fun of him he's not normal he can't function in society and so it's so easy for mcmurphy to say like why don't you if you are the one that committed yourself why don't you just leave mcmurphy has nothing wrong with him he doesn't understand that some people do have chronic things that they can't just leave this is at the end of this where they're sitting wait is this this chapter or is it 23 where Uh, he has the group and they this is next. Okay. So if you guys would like to, okay. we can move into so, chapter 23. Yeah, he basically just realizes that these people are in here for good. Yeah. But this next chapter, I was like... Yeah, and McMurphy realizes that everyone is there of their own free will. Mm-hmm. They hold the keys to their own cell and refuse to leave despite their grievances and their uh-huh. belly aching. And that everything that McMurphy had done up to this point was useless because these people could just up and leave at any moment that they please. Uh, unfortunately most of the chronics and mcmurphy are committed and are stuck Mm -hmm. there um so we will move into chapter 23 summarization Uh, mcmurphy has now been is now fed up towing the line Uh, during a group therapy session nurse ratchet announces that since none of the patients have decided to apologize for their previous misbehavior by uh, rebelling and pretending to watch the television in the world series Um, She and the rest of the staff have decided that taking away their privileges to use uh, the hydrotherapy room for their card games. uh, She asks if this seems fair and everyone looks to McMurphy for a response. He gets up from his chair and walks over to the window pane to the nurse's office and the medicine dispensary. And McMurphy says, I figure I could use uh, one of them smokes I bought this morning and breaks through the glass pane with his bare hand, grabbing a pack of smokes and remarking, Oh, I'm sorry. That glass pane was so spick and span, I didn't even notice it was there. Uh, McMurphy then sits back down in his seat where he was before and lights up a smoke. This was so cool. This was really bad. I was really not badass. expecting <laughs> like him he was to like put really his hand mad through he the was glass. Like, <laughs> he was like, yeah, well, since nobody's going to say anything, I'm going to take this away. And she was just like... Oh, she's like Umbridge. She's literally Dolores Umbridge. Terrible, <laughs> she's terrible. Like, Holding uh, things over people's like, heads, it's terrible. Just using everything against them, and he's sitting there just like, he bought all the, he bought three cartons, which is a lot. How probably, can he afford to buy, well. well back then, back they were then probably cigarettes weren't that expensive. The but same price, I'm pretty packs. sure cartons back then were the same price as like one pack today. Yeah, so he's buying cartons, which if you guys don't buy cigarettes, those are like a whole big old 
pack, like multiple packs it's like of cigarettes. like 20 packs. Yeah, you get, Let's so see. he's buying three cartons, and I don't know if they're using cartons to refer as one package, because I would say a pack of cigarettes, but we're we're from a different place, so other people might and say a different cartons. time. But if we say... If, a carton of cigarettes usually contains 10 packs, yeah, so totaling you buy 200 cigarettes. Oh my God. So my <laughs> grandma buys cartons, okay? So you buy cartons. He so bought you, 600 cigarettes. He bought a lot of cigarettes in, to set aside. And um, he was like, you know what? I just want a cigarette. I can just honestly, I, I've i honestly felt that mad before, like where you just get up and you're completely quiet about something. So like him just getting that taken away, it's like you can just imagine the rage in him. And he's like, I can't do anything. And it was like, they said that he like opened up his hand and just like got up and walked away. And everybody's watching him and it's like crickets. And he, they said he just put his hand through the glass. Yeah, like he did. I don't <laughs> think he even punched it. He, <laughs> he just, just put his went, hand like, no. through the glass. He, I feel like it was just him reaching, and he just did it extra hard just to act like he was just reaching for the cigarettes. Yeah, yeah, he just put All his bloody. hand right through the glass as if he were going to reach for Dude, the cigarettes. Man, that's a power move. It's such a fire. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what strength, too. And I mean, really. It's so metaphorical, and he's like, you know what? I'm going to break this invisible wall that you're putting between me <laughs> yeah. and my freedom. Yeah. And that's what he was doing in that moment, and I was like, oh. it's like, what a bad boy. Like, I'm like... <laughs> I love that he just hams it up, man. I mean, he hams everything up. He never drops the play for the most part. Mm -hmm. He loses his temper from time to time, but for for the most part, he always plays his role. Yeah. Like he like he never loses the act. Like he probably cut the shit out of his hand like pretty bad. Yeah, I can't imagine him not bleeding. like cutting yeah, his hand like really badly. Yeah, he's like bleeding all over the floor with glass hanging out of yeah, his hand. He's yeah. like, "Oh, sorry, I just didn't see that window. It's just so clean." Yeah. Goes and sits <laughs> in his chair with his blood <laughs> dripping on his cigarette. Which uh that remark is a callback to the pre like when he first got to the ward because, you know, he put his like big sausage fingers on the glass, the glass. and yeah. she got onto him for smudging it. She's like, Dude. "You're smudging the glass." Yeah. <laughs> So he makes a remark about how clean it was. That he didn't even see it was there, you know. <laughs> that maybe so if it hadn't been so clean and had sausage sausage finger fingerprints on there, that yeah. maybe he wouldn't have broke the glass. <laughs> it's just, it's a big flex, but at the same time, he's just doing himself, himself in, man. He, yeah, he's just putting another nail in his coffin. Yeah. Yeah. It's bad. So. I just, I don't want him to get shocked. So. We just know. figure since he's already committed that it doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm not Might sure. Might as well have fun. If I'm asking this question too early, but I would like to ask this at some point, if not to tonight or like, I think we'll be, our next session, will, we, should we be done with it or are we going to do, take um, two more? We'll do. Two more, I think. I thought. Okay. You think two this more? This is what we got left. If we do two sessions. Oh. Okay, yeah, that's perfect. Okay, yeah. So we'll have two more sessions about this. But I do think that the question arises, and I actually watched one of the clips from, um, oh, what is it called, with Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, Shutter Island, right? Mm. So there's a quote in Shutter Island where the main character, Leo's character, says, this place makes me wonder, is it better to um, live a monster or die a good man? So I think that the similar question is proposed in this story, um, whether or not it is better for McMurphy to um, to live a monster or to die a good man. And I don't think it's exactly that how, phrasing. How, how bad was he, though, really? Well, he's I mean, kind he's of a monstrous a guy. He didn't other than like, he's a criminal. That's yeah, really worst thing on his thing. record was statutory rape, so that's pretty bad. But, you know, other than that, yeah. we see him turning a pretty good leaf. <laughs> Can't like that yeah you can't really like God, that's all he did that's, <laughs> that's how like, he oh, says rape, it in the book that's too fine. <laughs> that's, that's fine. how he's really funny okay <laughs> yeah. i mean it's hard well in all this whole book just erases his past it's for so, the most part because so he's so hard. good in comparison to everyone he's surrounded by and i think that honestly that's what brings out him even being good in the first mm -hmm. place is because of how terrible that's everyone what I else love is about some literature and shows and stuff whenever a main character is an awful person or they're just not great and because of how they're written and how other characters around People them are like written them. 
they're likable. Like yeah. in Breaking Bad, you're always rooting for so Walter pro- White. He's even a protagonist. I wanted him right. to win. He's a protagonist villain. Yes. Right? Yeah, and he's not some. You want him to win. But I don't think that we can categorize McMurphy as a protagonist villain. I do think that he's, he's an anti-hero. He's not anti-hero. a Walter White. I think he's yeah. an anti-hero. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. don't think he's a hero. I think he's an anti-hero. Yeah. Because he's able, because all mm-hmm. of his heroic qualities is destroying a system, right? He's going against laws and regulations. Um, and so his rebellion is what's heroic. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can look at it. And I, I think if you if you don't observe his, his case record, he is a hero. Yeah. If you dispense with his case record, he's a hero. Yeah, and yeah. maybe... And I don't through even this, know if that... Maybe through this, he'll become a better person. I maybe think, he'll be a good person at the end of this, and maybe he'll get out and sell Will Chief, and things will well, be okay. Well, and I, so I think that that's what <laughs> yeah. this is, too, because I don't know... Like, and you guys can don't tell me what me. you think I don't about know. this. Um, because, like, concerning the question that I posed was whether, you know, is it would it be better for McMurphy to toe the line until he gets released? And allow everyone to just fall through again, back into the original state of living that they were. Or because undoubtedly, there. he increased the the value, the quality of life for everyone, right? But stay Even there che- forever for what? Like that's self being self sacrificing. Right. I don't know. I don't. But that's, that's what not I'm saying. His purpose. But almost every hero is self sacrificing, <sighs> right? So if he was to be the hero of the story like do you do you do you die for a cause because because that's that's the ending motion like because it's for for a cause how is he gonna take nurse ratchet down how is he gonna break the system i don't know that's what i I, you never know until you try because until until he actually does i mean he could get out of there and be like this these are the atrocities that happened to me let me go make movements to get my friends out that's a good argument if you live to fight another day then you could do more good than i he's a good actor he could really play the long run i could just like he could pretend to be docile he could pretend like um to take his medicine and act normal and admit to his flaws or whatever so he could get out or he could keep doing this and literally lose himself he could get shocked Mm -hmm. he could get put on heavier any psychotics whatever and yeah. lose his entire personality and who he is and everybody loses okay so with yeah. that being said i guess you guys might agree that this outburst that he has with the glass and the cigarettes is a losing of his composure right mm-hmm. is that he lost sight of what the goal the goal was yeah. and he indulged himself in his emotions and that this was a mistake on his part despite it being badass and awesome it was awesome and a really good gotcha move it's still cutting his nose off to spite his face right yep yeah he shouldn't have done it i Um, feel like even though he feels like in the moment he has the high ground and he's winning i feel like um miss ratchet is ahead of him she always has she's playing the long game she can wait years and he doesn't want to be there years Mm-hmm. And so she can keep him there as long as she wants to. Yeah. And, I mean, even if you have fun thwarting someone's authority, it's only fun for so long. You're not going to have fun doing that for, like, ten years. Yeah. So, He's not going to be able to And that's her job to subdue him. So now that we've pretty much decided that there's no possible way for him to uproot the system within... And that his only option is to toe the line in order to get out. What do you think uh, McMurphy would have to do in order to be released by by Ratchet? Potentially in the future pages, or I don't know. I don't know what people how people get released. From like, there. what do you think Murnus Ratchet would want? Like, do you um, think that she is even going to accept anything, or do you think that her standards are just infinite and there's nothing that he I could ever she, do? I feel want like him to admit that he is ordinary and that and he, he has stuff wrong, or even admit saying like, "Hey, I've been, you've helped me so much, Nurse Ratchet, and like boost her ego." I like, don't know. I don't her? think she'd believe. I it. don't even know. Like he's so manipulative, but I think like he would just have to pretend that he had a breakthrough. But I mm-hmm. think she's obsessed with believing he's not special. He doesn't have anything over her. And so she would want him to admit that I he think is not in power. He's she not would in switch it on him no matter what. 
Mm-hmm. So like she, she refused to, to send him won. to the disturbed ward, even though she had all the support from all of her faculty members. All of the doctors would have completely just mm-hmm. been willing to stamp it right on his papers and send him over to disturbed. She didn't want that because she had an opportunity to really stick it to him, right? Mm-hmm. And to like really ring him out. And so I think that even if he approached her with the attitude and the intention to be like, hey, listen, I am a con man. I decided to lie to everyone. And the only reason I came here is because the work farm work was too hard and I thought it'd be cushy here and it is. So that's the case. I don't even and think I think she would that. then I, she would be like, well, you're sick. You're just trying to get out of out of she, being committed yeah. and your your treatment's not over. You're trying to manipulate because you're a psychopath and it would just switch back. That's true. Yeah. I think yeah, she just wants total control. I feel like releasing somebody who's been committed is her losing power because Man. technically they can never get better. Yeah. Well, also, no I one does. She doesn't want she, them I mean, to get better. First of all, she makes them what's worse. the success rate in this place? Like, not what's the release high. rate? Not like, high. Who if lets, they die, they're released. Who, who <laughs> looks at that at that institution and is like, huh, there's like a zero, near 0% zero recovery rate on these patients. It's not about recovery. <laughs> they, no one so, cares during this time. So with this time, it's, it's you know, they want to take well, the least of society and tuck them away. According to them, right? Harding, not all institutions are this way. Harding says that other institutions are have already stopped using EST. Yeah. Right. And so, there was a big revolution about that time. Like well, and part of that things. was this book. Yeah. Even so, though they still use it. Yeah. yeah. And people are like, oh, EST is not like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Don't believe it. People still use it Whatever. today. Whatever. Yeah, it, I mean, my, I talked to my mom about it, terrifying. and she was telling me the pros and stuff of it, that she knows someone that every, like, two years or something, they go and get it done. And they put you to sleep, and they shock your brain. And honestly... They do it in very low dosages. I don't know. I'm not educated on that. And you're for a little bit. It's <sighs> strange, because I so also thought it was weird. very strange, not... It's so inhumane to us now. Like, it makes no sense to us, but, like... I don't know. Your brain is made up of electricity and has electro-like chemicals in it, but, like... Has its I'm, current. Has its own electro electromagnetic current or whatever. Like, it's a yeah, electronic that's, current. Yeah, that's amazing, but, like, I mean, I guess if your brain is misfiring and messing up, that if you kickstart it, it could change... I mean, it obviously changes personalities, right? Well, so it obviously changes if you're doing it in high doses. But what about minor doses? If you have something like Tourette's or um, epilepsy or something Well, if something you do like minor dose, like first of all, I don't know how they were are able to direct the electrical current precisely where they need it to go. Well, neurosurgery no, Because it has to go from now. one end to the other, which is why they put these two on the end. So, like, the electricity has to pass through. And it essentially passes in a line, but even go, though it's jagged. They open you up, I think. And so, they do it, like laparoscopically. I don't, I don't no, that's with did. lobotomy. But um, they uh, do it no, um, I mean, surface level, I thought. No, now nowadays, like, like they take, they get your brain shot. Yeah, I, I don't know about it. I don't know if they're able to like direct but the electricity through a specific guys, portion of the brain. With Parkinson's, they put like chips inside people's brains that have electricity because their Mm -hmm. brain is misfiring causing them to have tremors yeah so those um i don't know if they're chips but they're some they're a piece of like they're a mechanism that go inside your brain and also with cochlear implants like that's a part of thing that like it's putting electricity and like currents into your brain that help you hear yeah so but the whole point of est is to destroy a portion of the brain but in this so that they stop uh being violent right and so especially yeah. in this book it is a negative outcome and it is really detrimental and dangerous especially how they used to use it oh, yeah. so maybe modern medicine has come farther than what we've thought but i still wouldn't i still wouldn't do it i mean like i, I just feel I feel like there are so many other things that you could do. I don't know. Go outside. Go for a hike. Obviously, it's showing in our book that laughter and people having real human con- like connection and communication is actually the best therapy. Versus well, we're seeing tons of literature coming out right now about like brain inflammation. Mm-hmm. 
So if we can uh, yeah. cure the inflammation They're in the brain, then the symptoms go away. Doses. And yeah. everything is li linked to, like, all kinds of things is brain inflammation. Depression, anxiety, yeah. all kinds of different, like, mm -hmm. abnormal uh, psychological issues as well, which but are, like, seemingly untouchable for a long time. What about, like, people who have it, like, genetically, like, genetic schizophrenia or, like, genetic, like, bipolarism? I don't think you can. Because I just don't think that. that those are curable because there are mm -hmm. so many things that are psychological you're, and not physiological within the actual brain as far as i've heard it is that if you're not born with it you don't have to keep it but the inverse of that is also true well that's not always true because like um trauma-based dissociative identity disorder that's right. or trauma-based um ptsd or schizophrenia or anything like that because a lot of those can be trauma-based um bipolar as well mm -hmm. but um if it's trauma-based it's virtually impossible to get rid of yeah. it because well, you can't it's always up, it's in whenever you're especially that, that because it, if it happens when you're a child and especially because it can break your brain and your neuro pathways so much especially with like um dissociative identity disorder the trauma is so intense that it's dissociating yourself that experienced the trauma mm -hmm. and making a separate individual that doesn't have that trauma so it might make, so if you were raped when you were six years old, it might, you might have a six-year-old mm -hmm. identity and also whatever age you are. Mm -hmm. And they might not know about each other. They might know about each other, but mm -hmm. it's, um, it's very um, intense and it can't be reversed. And also extremely reversed. rare. Yeah, it's, but it can't be reversed like It's actually like at least anything. two million people and in the also United States have it. really, really... Uh, like it's controversial. It's very as well. controversial. Mm -hmm. However, I really agree with it. Not Actually, many people even, agree on how to define it. I even, think a lot of dissociative identity <laughs> disorder is definitely misdiagnosed or not. And patient, patient, and doctors can kind of whir up things with between each other, right? So you can get misdiagnosed. However, it is really proven. Like you have to be between the ages of like like two and seven whenever you experience trauma. Because we dissociate all the time, right? But children do it, like... Disassociate, when, yeah. Or disassociate yeah. all the time. So, like, we do it when we're driving and stuff like that, or, like, just spaced out. Um, but kids, when they go through trauma... So, like, my grandmother was, like, really abused, and she said, like, one time, like, her dad was... She couldn't do these math problems, and her dad just started hitting her in the hands with a fly swatter every time that she got it wrong. And she said that she just felt herself. She saw herself. She saw it herself being hit. She saw herself like being like abused, but she just left her body. And people who have panic attacks do that where they can like see themselves. Yeah. Like, and that's dissociation. So children do not have the mental capacity to handle trauma. Their brain just shuts down. So that's where that fragmenting occurs. Yeah. And repression occurs. So repression, um, has even happened to me like within my own childhood where I just have like chunks of like I like I don't remember being four years old because like I had so much bad stuff happen to me at four so it's like you just don't remember that but that doesn't necessarily mean you have dissociative identity disorder yeah but like your brain just you can't process it so it just it just makes you forget it but I also think a common misconception with dissociative identity disorder is that like because of media and stuff Split. like that Simple, yes oh Split. it's so is, damaging is that to people with dissociative identity disorder because you're not actually like breaking all was that okay yeah um i've had panic attacks where i can see myself <laughs> like outside of my body yeah it's but you're not scary. just like breaking all your bones and turning into a different person no that and is, like i feel like it's more it's you all follow, mental, obviously, but what? Do you follow dissociated on YouTube? No. I feel like you do, because, like, your, your rhetoric. I like this, oh. Brooke. This is a good conversation. Thank you. <laughs> I read a lot on psychology. Did you, did you read so. Astro? He says, oh, yes, brain inflammation. I know a few people that are airheads. He says, third person <laughs> camera unlocks. Just need irreparable traumatic experiences. Yes, nice. it's terrible. <laughs> nice. it's like, do you want the third person? Do you want first person or third person? And it's that, you just need some it's trauma. It's that fight or flight response. Actually, some there's a whole new thing about the fourth trauma response, which is called the fawn response. 
So, like, we have our fight or flight. So, like, we run. What are the three trauma responses? Do you guys, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, like you, you run. It's, you, it's fight, flight, freeze. Yeah, fight, flight, right, freeze. Yes. And then there's fawn. So, like, um, people who have been through freeze. fawn where it's, like, the baby the baby deer that stays with the mama lion, like, out of necessity, even though it does no good for them. So, like, people who have been through trauma, like, are people pleasers. Like, they're constantly, like, insecure in their relationships. They gravitate towards toxic people. Like, they just, because they're so, like, used to that, and that's, like, another trauma response. Well, that happens with a lot of things. It also happens with, um, whenever little boys are raped by men, and they end up... Yeah, Rapist. I don't Rapist know. And gay. Yeah, a lot mm-hmm. of times they turn out to be child molesters, but I think that pedophilia is an entirely different mental illness. I think it is a mental illness. It is a mental that illness. They it, is, it is not a control. fetish. Shane Dawson. God. No, that's pedophilia is a mental illness. It is not something that they Man. can yes. control. It you is not a get, fetish. You get it into the weeds. Behavior. I don't advocate for pedophilia. If you want to know some good stuff about pedophilia, I haven't read the book yet. But um, what is the Russian the Russian novel? Oh, Lolita. I, Lolita. I was yeah, guys. Lolita. I wanted to read it, but then I was like, guys, this is really inappropriate. But Lolita yeah. is well, a it's, very good it's novel. on the list of books that we might read. Um, oh, sweet. It's in the you book. Should. It's in the hat. So next it's time, so disturbing. Two what is it? two what sessions from that? now. So, well, I don't know anything about it. Don't okay. tell me about it, because I just want to read it. Okay, all I know is you. that sorry, it sorry, spawned sorry. Uh, an urban dictionary term, and that's all I know about it. Vaguely, well, it that an pedophilia? older man wants a relationship with a younger woman, um, and that's it's it. It's basically everything that this girl does is sexually attracted to this man, and sh- this little girl is seducing him. He, yeah. in his mind. Yeah, that's so, so... See, that's why it ties into being a yeah. mental illness, because I don't think that they can control... Yeah, well, also, so another book that has great insights on um, pedophilia Mm -hmm. is uh, Theodore Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. There's a character in there that is a pedophile, and I have not seen or read anything better that gives you an insight on what a pedophile experiences um, that um, hates themselves for it, right? Well, so if you want to, if you want to read something cool about it, shame about it, yeah. because yeah. and it was spurred by their childhood, and that's why it's usually a, a trauma-born really mental illness. Yeah. So pedophilia is not an organic behavior, and this is something we have to learn in education and to really be aware of it because depends on what you mean organic. It's it's not. It's uh, you have to have something happen to you be that way like does that make sense like you're know. just Who not started walking around oh the chicken or the egg right right i mean that's um, impossible you couldn't you yeah, couldn't have someone that's true well that's there true. probably was but someone it, evil usually, in the world right. that maybe was a hebophile and then they created a pedophile because well it's also hebophiles difficult, are more difficult common. to even qu- answer the question because i mean like marriage for people now is like much different than it was before so marrying yeah. like a 13 to 16 year old was not unheard of between like a 16 mm-hmm. to 13 year old and like a 45 year old man and it's, so it's just yeah. kind of crazy the perceptions that people have of like pedophiles especially in our society so like um all right guys so what percentage do you think that people get like molested by strangers a lot by strangers by strangers Less like that you don't no no very low it's actually wow. just like only like one yeah. percent of all like molestation cases it's always somebody that you know it is an acquaintance it's all it's a family member because if, a family if, member. if you think about a family barbecue think about your cousins think about your uncles yeah and the access to every child that is there well even just so, think about in your personal experience how huge. many people you know that have had that happen yeah by so members. psa if you have any like man that is interested in your child overly interested yeah that is not normal male behavior there should never be That's a man not who's normal overly interested in your children behavior either because there are a lot of female pedophiles that are more socially accepted because I, women yeah. are seen as caring for children even though they could be too caring and people yeah. overlook Yo, it what like you whenever about the that, person what is that the, plays with the kids at birthday parties and stuff you instead are. of adults. <laughs> so like what O'Reilly. do you okay so we'll talk I'm a teacher <laughs> we'll we'll okay i think i think we've done it yeah. we've talked about the whole yeah. book so 
Um, right. I don't know how any of that relates to the previous part. <laughs> it doesn't, part, it doesn't, it doesn't but, um, but we started talking. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You got your bonus hey, content. Hey, but um, McMurphy, statutory rape. So, yes. hebophile right yeah. there. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so, yeah. So, like, like said, <laughs> I'm not going to elaborate. He tied it in. We yeah. went full circle. Um, yeah, please like and so, subscribe. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Again, if you missed it, there are show notes and timestamps in the description below if you're watching on YouTube. Um, and we will hopefully be having another session covering uh, part three, all of part three, um, next week around this time anywhere between Friday to Sunday is usually whenever we are able to get together hopefully Ren will be with us mm-hmm. and we can have the full gang together because I think it's been a little while since we've had it all has. four of us um, so yeah really excited if you guys would like to suggest any books for us to read the only three criteria that you have to adhere to for the suggestions are that the book be uh, equal to or less than 300 pages it must have one or more film adaptations, although that one's a bit optional. And it also must be widely respected and considered a classic piece of literature. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you would like, you can either drop those suggestions on to the uh, comment section here on this video, or you can go to the Dillo Din Discord, which is uh, a link here in the description as well, and you can just drop it there in the su- suggestions box. Um, so yeah, uh, Astro just did the exclamation mark Discord while we're live on Twitch here, and that will take you to the Discord. Thank you so much, Astro. So we will see you guys hopefully next week, and I might be doing a few other conversations about, I will be finishing A Farewell to Arms, hopefully very soon, because I've finished all the summarization for Good. the last like 30 chapters, and uh, I will also be doing a conversation with um, a guy named Ironic and Iconic, a friend of mine from Canada, and we will be discussing The Most Dangerous Game, a short story. So if you guys would like to listen to that, it's a very short story. As it says, it's a short story. So you can yeah. read it with us if you'd like. And uh, we'll be talking about that uh, soon, coming up. So we'll tell you when that is. Thank you guys so much, and we will see you on the flip side. <laughs>